Hi, I'm Charlotte Aiton, a graduate student at the University of Rochester, and this is the first in a series of talks on universal algebra and lattice theory. So I will head over to my notes here. Okay, so it is perhaps a slight inconvenience that my notes are over here. I've discovered that this is the natural monitor on which to annotate my notes. However, you are viewing from over here, and so I'll often be looking sideways, but hopefully you're getting a good side of me and will still be able to experience my gestures accordingly. All right. So, as I said, this is the beginning of a series of talks on universal algebra and lattice theory. Uh, today, I'm going to just be talking about a uh, general introduction to the subject and some relevant background. So, universal algebra is the study of algebraic structures. So then, there are three natural questions that you might have at this point, which are, what is an algebraic structure? What precisely do we study about these algebraic structures, whatever they are. And why should we do any of this, which is a fair question to ask when studying a new subject. And so I will explain how I came to study this subject in order to answer these questions. So to begin with, when I was about 12, I became interested in division by zero. Um, it was the noughties, and so it was a sort of popular thing in the culture at the time to joke about division by zero and what would happen if one were to divide by zero. Presumably it would create a black hole or destroy the universe or something of that nature. Um, so having seen the introduction of new symbols to solve equations like 2 plus x equals 1, 3 times x equals 1, or x squared equals minus 1, I wanted to produce a new symbol uh, call it alpha, so that zero times alpha was equal to one, analogous to how I had previously seen negative numbers, uh, rational numbers, which were integers, and uh, imaginary numbers, like I introduced before. So uh, doing arithmetic with alpha seemed challenging, since many of the usual rules I knew didn't work anymore. <laughs> and so, for example, we have that zero times zero times alpha is actually zero times alpha, which is one, because zero times alpha is one by definition. Well, if I multiply the rightmost zero and alpha together first, I get one on the right, and then zero times one is zero, but zero is not equal to one, and so the associative law must fail. Of course, Perhaps we could have a system where one was equal to zero, but I don't, I don't want that. I don't want to change the rules that are already established for existing numbers like zero and one. Okay, so I had experimented with that. And then if we jump forward a little bit, seven years later, I was a student at Monroe Community College and I was a bit more mathematically sophisticated. I wrote a paper laboriously using the equation editor in Microsoft Word in which I defined a collection of so-called apportional numbers as equivalence classes in analogy with the definition of the rational numbers. So in addition uh, to numbers like uh, three-fourths, I also allowed numbers like uh, one over zero, or even more involved things like three-fourths over zero, and then itself over zero. So I defined equivalence classes of some collection of such forms, just formally defined as uh, just symbols, and then I proceeded to define a multiplication operation on these classes and prove that it was well-defined. So that regardless of which uh, form you choose to represent your number, like for example, uh, just as in the rational numbers, two-fourths and one-half would actually represent the same number or belong to the same equivalence class. Um, so two is this multiplication that I defined um, actually uh, 
an operation that you can compute um, by taking any representatives you want and always getting the same, uh, a member of the same equivalence class. So my system failed to be associative, even though it had a well-defined operation. Uh, but I was able to prove that no such system could satisfy the associative law. So that means that I hadn't failed, in some sense, to uh, produce such a system. I mean, I had failed to manufacture such a thing, but it wasn't so much a failure on my part as it was a failure of such a thing to exist. And so no matter how hard I tried, I would not have been able to produce such an algebraic structure or such a system because it cannot exist. And so that was a bit of a relief to discover. So I did an independent study in abstract algebra at the end of my time at community college, which covered group theory up to the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. That's not finitely generated abelian groups, just finite abelian groups. Inspired by my interest in division by zero, and now working a bit more abstractly, I defined a new class of objects to study. I said that a ripple is a set A equipped with a binary operation, so that for each x and a, there exists some y in a, so that x times y is y times x is x. This is to say that x absorbs y, and this is similar to the behavior that zero has in the familiar number systems where zero times x is always x times zero, and that is always zero. And so zero absorbs the other elements in those systems. Uh, there were no other assumptions I made on the nature of the binary operation for these ripples, as I called them. Uh, I was able to define direct products and isomorphisms for ripples, and I proved a few results about them. So after community college, I was transferred to, uh, <laughs> I transferred to the University of Rochester. Suppose I transferred myself. <laughs> well, uh, while an undergraduate there, I learned about rings and modules in algebra courses, as well as their respective definitions of homomorphisms, products, and the isomorphism theorems, which were all quite similar to those for groups. I distinctly remember being told on at least one occasion that we weren't going to prove one of the isomorphism theorems for a new class of algebraic structures, like say for modules when we had already done it for rings, uh, because the proof was basically the same as the one we had done before. So an example of a very similar pair of theorems is the following. Uh, these are both formulations of uh, what some people call the first isomorphism theorem, uh, other people call the homomorphism theorem or the factor theorem. So given a group homomorphism, H, uh, taking a group G1 to G2, we actually have that G1 mod the kernel of this homomorphism, that normal subgroup, is isomorphic to the image of G1 under the homomorphism H, which is a subgroup of G2. Uh, this isomorphism is explicitly given by mapping the cosat containing G of the kernel of H to the image of G under the homomorphism H for any given G in the group G1. We have a very similar theorem uh, about rings, which says that if we have a ring homomorphism H from a ring R1 to another ring R2, we actually have that the quotient of R1 by the kernel of the homomorphism H, which is now an ideal of R1, uh, is actually isomorphic to the image of R1 under H, which is now a subring of R2. So this isomorphism is explicitly given by mapping the coset containing R of the kernel of H to the image of R under H for any little r in R1. So it seemed to me at this point logical that since groups, rings, and modules were all algebraic structures, still not actually explicitly defined, but all part of this, you know, somewhat nebulous concept of algebraic structure, that there should be some explicit general definition of an algebra 
with corresponding homomorphisms, direct products, quotients, and so forth, which perhaps also included my own peculiar, not necessarily associative systems, like my apportional number system, which I had studied at community college, and maybe my ripples, which I had proved some basic results about as well, and which were not required to be associative. So with such a setup, one can hope to prove the isomorphism theorems once and for all, <laughs> without making any reference to the particular type of system under consideration, whether it was a group or a ring, or a module or some other thing. So by around 2015, I had written down some definitions which were very similar to the following ones, uh, which are standard. So all of the algebraic structures which we have seen, groups, rings, modules, and even my oddball examples, have a collection of elements as well as a way to add or multiply them, maybe more than one, as in the case with rings or modules. So in a group G, we can think of the product of two elements as given by a function, F mapping the Cartesian product of G with itself, or ordered pairs of elements of G, to elements of G. So we can also think of the sum and product in a ring in this way. Well, most multiplications we see come uh, combine two elements to produce another one. Uh, there are also non-binary multiplications. These may combine three or more elements at once to produce a new element of the same type. And being, you know, kind people, we would like to treat these in the same way that we treat the usual binary operations and let them join in on the fun. So uh, we're going to write uh, blackboard W to indicate the set of whole numbers, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth through all the counting numbers. Given a set A and some whole number N, which is again allowed to be 0, we define the collection of N tuples in A to be the collection A to the N of all ordered lists of elements of exactly N elements of A, which are not required to be distinct. We can also think of a to the n as the set of all functions from the set 1, 2, up through n to a. The set a to the n itself is called the nth Cartesian power of a. So now we'll explicitly describe a to the n for small values of n. We have that a to the 0 contains a single element. We can either think of this element as the empty tuple so this would be the two braces without any elements of A in between them, sort of an empty ordered list where there are zero things in the list, uh, or as the empty function, I call it E, from the empty set to the set A. Uh, if you put a little thought into this and what the formal definition of a function is as a collection of pairs in some Cartesian product, you will see that there should be a unique function from the empty set to any other particular set. And that function is essentially the same data as having an empty tuple whose entries, whose zero many entries belong to that set. So if we move on to uh, A to the first Cartesian power, we see that this set is in bijection with A in a canonical way. Since we can identify the one tuple or the ordered list containing a single little a in A with the element little a for any little a in our set A. Elements of A squared are just ordered pairs A1, A2 for some A1, A2, and A, which again are not required to be distinct but are in a specified order. Elements of A cubed are ordered triples A1, A2, A3 for any particular choices of A1, A2, A3, and our set A. Where repeats are allowed, but the order does matter. And elements of A to the N for larger N are similar. So now we can define an operation or a way of multiplying many different elements from a set together. So if we have a set A and some whole number n 
we refer to a function f taking the nth Cartesian power of a to itself as an n-ary operation on the set a. When f is an n-ary operation on a, we say that f has arity n. So the case we're most familiar with is n equals 2, which is that of a binary operation. And that language of having a binary operation is something with which uh, you perhaps are already familiar with if you are watching this video. <laughs> so an operation of arity zero amounts to choosing an element of A. Uh, we call such operations constant or null arity. And uh, we can actually think of those as, again, just mapping the empty tuple to a particular element of our set A, and the image of that empty tuple is the element we're thinking of as the constant value of that function. An operation of arity 1 is essentially a function from A to itself. We call such operations unary. And this is, again, because A to the first power is canonically in bijection with just a itself. And so having a map from a to the first power to itself is basically just having a map from a to a. We already discussed operations of arity 2. Operations of arity 3 are ways of multiplying, so to speak, exactly three objects in a specified order in order to obtain another of the same type. We call such operations ternary. And as we already defined, in general, if we have some n, then we say that an operation combining exactly n different things together, or combining an ordered list of n things together, some of which may be repeated, is called an n ary operation on the set A. So for example, there are 17 ary operations and 23,457,327,453 ary operations. There are operations of all different arities. Now we're finally ready to define an algebra. And instead of nebulously referring to algebraic structure as uh, something that's like a group or a module or a ring, without actually specifying what precisely those things are or what the general algebraic structure is. Of course, you know what groups, rings, and modules themselves are. Uh, we now are ready to give an actual formal definition which encompasses all of these things. So an algebra consists of a set A and a sequence F whose entries are little f i indexed on some set I where these little fi are operations on A, as we just defined operations previously. So we can think of an algebra as consisting of an underlying set A and some specified indexed or ordered, if you would like, sequence of operations on that set. So it's basically a set and a bunch of different ways of multiplying or adding or combining, in some sense, the elements of that set together to get other elements of that set. We often write, uh, we often write bold A is defined to be equal to AF to indicate we're defining A to be the algebra AF. If I'm writing by hand, I will often write A with a line underneath it in order to indicate that that's my bold A, since it's challenging for me to indicate that um, by hand otherwise. In some sources, you'll see A with the underline in it explicitly uh, typeset. We refer to the set A, which I also just called the underlying set of the algebra, as the universe of A. So this would be the universe in universal algebra, perhaps, at least one meaning of that word. Uh, we refer to the little fi as the basic operations of A. Of course, there are many operations which one could define on the set A, but the little fi are the basic operations of A, the ones that are actually associated to this particular algebra. So we've now answered the question, what is an algebraic structure? In universal algebra, what we mean by an algebraic structure is precisely uh, this formal definition.
So let's, uh, let's see some examples and notation. We're going to write uh, blackboard n to indicate the set one, two, three, and so forth of all of the natural numbers or counting numbers. We often consider algebras A, which have universe A and some indexed sequence of basic operations, Fi, uh, for little i and some index set big I, uh, where i is one, two, up through k, so the first k natural numbers, not including zero. Uh, so in this case, we're going to actually write uh, A, the algebra is defined to be the underlying set A or the universe A, along with the sequence F1, F2, up through Fk, rather than writing A is defined to be A big F. This is just going to simplify our notation a little bit. And the case where we only have a finite uh, list of basic operation, uh, operations indexed by the first k natural numbers is the case that we're going to look at the most at first. Groups can actually be thought of as algebras in our formal sense of the form g is defined to be uh, g with this asterisk operation where g is the set of elements of the group and this asterisk is the map from pairs of elements of g to g uh, which is nothing but the group multiplication for that group uh, bold G. So rings can similarly be thought of as algebras of the form bold R is defined to be R, the set of ring elements, with the usual addition and multiplication defined on them, each of which are binary operations according to our general definition of an operation on a set. So these actually aren't the only ways that we can formulate groups and rings as algebras in our sense, but for now, they're enough to give a basic example of. Now let's move on to talking about a new concept, similarity types. Note that groups as formulated previously have only a single binary operation well, rings have two binary operations. So at least to get started, we only want to compare algebras whose operations can be identified with one another. So if I have an algebra A with some sequence of basic operations, we're going to define a map row taking that index set big I to the whole numbers where the image of the whole number I under row is nothing but the arity of the basic operation little f i. And so this map taking indices to, their to the arity of their corresponding operations is called the similarity type of the algebra A. When two algebras A and B have the same similarity type, some function rho taking the same index set, they, the two algebras must have the same index set, uh, to the whole numbers, we say that A and B are similar algebras. And so, for example, if I have two groups, say G1 with some basic operation star 1 and some G2 with some basic operation star 2, well, each of these uh, basic operations is binary. We can imagine them both as being indexed by the single set containing the element 1. And so these two algebras would be similar algebras to each other. So these are uh, similar algebras because we can think of them in the same way. They're a set with a binary operation. Now, if we look at an example of a ring with some operation addition and some other operation multiplication, now this is a set with two binary operations, which we can think of as being indexed by the, uh, by the elements of the set containing one and two. And so these two algebras, this group with only one binary operation and this ring with two binary operations, these are not similar. 
algebra is. And so as we're going to see, many constructions and many basic concepts will only make sense if we're working with similar algebras. It's not really clear how to take the direct product of a group and a ring, for instance, although maybe you could cook up some way in which that makes sense. Uh, a priori, it's not really clear how I would identify the multiplication in the group with the addition or the multiplication in the ring in order to produce another algebraic structure. Again, you might be able to come up with a, a definition that makes sense in that particular case of a group and a ring, but in general, it's harder to compare two algebras whose basic operations are not uh, giving you the same similarity type when considered together. Okay, and so now for some examples where it's natural to only consider algebras of the same similarity type, let's look at some basic concepts which also appear in more elementary abstract algebra. Let's talk about subalgebras and homomorphisms. If we have a set A, we denote by SB of A, the power set of A, or the collection of all subsets of A. You may also see this denoted by two to the A, or a uh, calligraphic P of A is also often used. We'll use SB of A, and it means the same thing. So if we have two algebras, A and B, of the same similarity type, rho, taking the same index set, which is shared by both of the algebras, I, uh, to W, to the whole numbers, then we say that B is a subalgebra of A when the universe of B is a subset of the universe of A. And if we look at each index, little i, in our index set, big I, we have that the ith basic operation of B, so G little i, is actually nothing but the restriction of the ith basic operation for A to those tuples which only contain elements from the set B. And so formally, this is how we would write it because the domain of this function, Fi, is actually the row of ith Cartesian power of, of the universe of B, uh, but it might be easier to just think of it as that the basic operation G sub i here is just given by plugging the tuples of elements from B into the basic operation for the algebra A. Also, we say that a function H taking the universe of A to the universe of B is a homomorphism from the algebra A to the algebra B, when for each i in our index set i and all, uh, and all collections of row of i many little a's from the universe of A, we have that the image of the product of these little a's under, under some operation f sub i is the same thing as if we first map all the little a's over to b by using h, and then multiply them according to g sub i, the corresponding basic operation. So we can either start off over here in a and multiply our two elements together, and then send that thing over to b, or we can start off with our two elements of a over here, and then send them over to B and multiply them there. Either way, if we get the same answer every time, that's what we mean by H being a homomorphism. Of course, it doesn't have to be two elements, that would be for a binary operation, but now you can imagine if I had three or 17 billion elements, I could either multiply them first and then send them over, or I could send them each over by themselves and then combine them over here. If I always get the same answer either way, that's what it means to be a homomorphism. For that map H, sending things over to be a homomorphism. And so again, this is something that only really makes sense for, uh, for similar algebras 
because I need to actually have the corresponding basic operation f sub i and g sub i, which doesn't really make any sense if the signatures of these two algebras aren't the same. Okay, so similarly, no pun intended, we can define direct or external products uh, just as we would have for groups or rings or other things. So if I have a sequence, a sub j, so now this is an index sequence of algebras, each with its own universe and its own index sequence of basic operations. If I have an index sequence of algebras of all of the same similarity type, rel, then we define the product of this sequence to, to be this algebra, which we denote by the Cartesian product over the index set j of the a sub j, whose universe is a, which is nothing but the Cartesian product of the universes a sub j of each of the algebras a sub j, and whose ith basic operation is of the same arity as the ith basic operation of all of the other algebras, which we are considering, uh, where this operation is explicitly given by, well, if I want to know what g sub i does to a collection of elements of A, each of those elements of the set A is a sequence of elements of the corresponding A sub j. And so if I want to multiply those sequences together, then the natural thing for me to do is to look at each coordinate and multiply the corresponding elements of those sequences together course, according to the basic operation f sub i. And so if that seems like a little much to consume at once in a couple seconds, it's okay because this is again just an introduction and I will go over this in excruciating detail at a future date. So you can stay tuned for that video. But just to give you an idea, this does actually generalize the familiar definition of an arbitrary indexed product of groups or rings or modules. So some people say that universal algebra is purely the study of varieties, which are classes of similar algebras closed with respect to homomorphisms, subalgebras, and products. Those three things which I just defined. So I actually, um, so while this is an answer to the question, what precisely do we study about algebraic structures? Um, the answer being, we basically study homomorphism, subalgebras, and products, and the properties which are somehow preserved by those, or in other words, the properties of varieties. Uh, I think this is a little bit too restrictive of a definition. Uh, if you're, um, there are some people really in this direction, but uh, I myself was actually initially unsure that universal algebra captured what I wanted it to uh, because I originally found that description of the discipline when I was trying to read about different areas of math to see what uh, allowed me to do these things which I was interested in, you know, combining these isomorphism theorems into a single theorem, incorporating these other strange sorts of algebraic structures that I had experimented with. Um, I wanted something more down to earth to start with. Well, I think that uh, varieties are certainly a very interesting and worthy topic of study. Um, I wanted to start off with something which I felt was more elementary because I was just getting started. And so I wanted to have a set of tools so that if I was given, for example, a particular algebra and not this big class closed with respect to these, you know, these operators, I just wanted to know how, if I had some particular crazy algebra A, um, say uh, with two basic operations, F1 and F2, where F1 was 12 ARI and F2 simultaneously multiplied 313 uh, different elements of A together according to some weirdo rule. Uh, I wanted to be able to understand the structure of that algebra or decompose it like I was able to do with groups and rings. 
I thought that this would be a really cool thing to be able to do. And certainly I felt like that would be a first step towards investigating these more involved abstract situations, which were also interesting sounding, but not the basic thing I wanted to accomplish initially. So now we finally address the question of why should we do this? Why did I even end up studying universal algebra if I was initially unsure about the whole situation? Um, well, first of all, I mainly wanted to understand the structure of general algebras because I thought it would, it was, it would be cool. That's basically the reason. So happily, universal algebra does provide tools for doing this. So it turns out that although the slogan may be that universal algebra is the study of varieties of algebras, uh, or in other words, classes closed with respect to homomorphisms, subalgebras, and products, uh, it turns out that some of the basic work in universal algebra does revolve around such decomposition of algebras into more basic pieces. And so I was happy about that. Now, like any mathematical subject, people often study universal algebra purely because they like the objects involved. Algebras themselves play the role that numbers do in number theory, and later on, we will see how to find special ones which are analogous to the prime numbers. And so when I was talking about decomposition just a second ago, actually, those special ones are basically uh, the pieces that you end up getting when you decompose a general algebraic structure into its more basic building blocks. And so uh, just as people think the prime numbers are cool and always are looking to find new prime numbers, I think it's cool to find uh, new algebras that satisfy that, uh, that same sort of property. And again, this is just an introduction, so I'll elaborate on precisely what I mean by all of that in a future video. Universal algebra also has interesting ties to many area of, areas of mathematics, including a very strong connection to lattice theory, which I will begin to describe next time. Uh, the series is called Universal Algebra and Lattice Theory, so it's only fair that I do start talking about lattice theory at some point. Uh, but we will actually see over time how it comes in more and more until its, its presence is felt very strongly within the subject. So those connections to other areas of math will sometimes make themselves uh, apparent as one learns the basic tools and examples. And so that's the case with lattice theory. We'll discuss others at the end of the semester. Some areas that touch universal algebra include graph theory, analysis, topology, and number theory. In uh, pure algebra, a great deal of work has been done on varieties of groups. So even for those people who are purely interested in the study of the theory of groups, actually many of the tools and concepts of universal algebra appear in pure group theory, so to speak. And as I mentioned before, there is this unification that happens where we see that techniques uh, which are described separately in group theory or ring theory or module theory are actually unified in a much deeper way when we consider general algebraic structures as opposed to these particular cases. So this unified formulation of theorems and concepts, which happens in universal algebra, can make working with the objects of classical algebra easier. One gets a clear idea of which properties actually depend on the particular class of algebras in question. When you prove a theorem which applies to groups or rings without actually using things like uh, associativity or being able to find an inverse of an element, then you really understand that although you may have somehow or other tried to use some of those things before to prove results, this particular result actually doesn't inherently depend on those concepts. And that can really help you to clarify where those things are relevant in solving future problems or where they're not. <laughs> 
Uh, Universal Algebra also has applications in computer science, and although I'm not as much in the applied math direction myself, I can certainly point you in the direction of people who are and who are exploring those connections if you are so interested. All right, so I want to thank you very much for checking out this introduction and listening to a little bit of my life story. I'm very excited to start this series of talks on universal algebra and lattice theory. I think it's a universally cool and interesting thing to be researching, which is why I've spent so much of my life studying it. And I really look forward to uh, seeing you or at least having you see me next time. Thank you.